our prophecy update, I just want to quickly mention, especially for the benefit of our uh, online church, that next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. We're going to be celebrating uh, Resurrection Sunday, and as such, we're not going to have our uh, prophecy update. We will, Lord willing, resume the prophecy update the following Sunday, which is April 23rd. Also, uh, please keep the Egyptian Christians in prayer. Uh, some of you may have heard the breaking news this morning that on Palm Sunday, uh, the same Christian group that the Islamic State targeted in mass beheadings a few years back was attacked today uh, when two explosions killed, uh, and this death toll it seems is rising, but at least 37 uh, Christians while they were in church on this uh, Palm Sunday. And also, uh, please uh, keep in prayer the Syrian people, especially the Syrian Christians who are still in Syria, which is what we're going to talk about today. I believe that what happened this last week was one of the most significant events to take place in several months prophetically. And what I'm speaking of, of course, is the chemical weapons in Syria that were used on Tuesday and the swift response to it on the part of the U.S. president. I never want to, and I, in fact, I appreciated a comment from somebody uh, in our online church that said that I, I really appreciate uh, your balanced approach. You don't, you know, you're not sensational, which I think sometimes I get a little bit excited, but I never want it to come off as being, you know, sensational or provocative, and I certainly don't want this to come off that way, but I truly uh, do not believe that most people have any idea, and most Christians especially, sadly, have any idea about how serious what took place last week is. Uh, let me give you, especially for those of you who are really unaware of the timeline, just a real quick timeline of what happened and how and when it all went down. On Tuesday, Bashar al-Assad used chemical weapons on his own people for what some believe was actually about the 40th time over the last six years, if you can imagine. On Thursday, President Trump ordered a strike launching 59 Tomahawk missiles on the Syrian airfield from which the chemical weapons originated. Then on Friday, and we're gonna talk about this more in a moment, Russia responded by sending a warship into the area where our U.S. ships were located. And again, this is very serious and has the potential to escalate very quickly. Enter U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, a.k.a. Haley's Comet, as she has been <laughs> affectionately referred to. And we're going to also talk more about her uh, shortly. But pictured here, Haley is showing two graphic photos of children who were victims of this horrific attack. Now, here in the United States, they have... Uh, it's hard not to... Uh, show these, and they have been, I think, careful. They've kind of uh, blocked out some of the more disturbing images. In the Middle East, they, they see this in all of its graphic form, and it is just, there are no words. It is just unthinkable. It is uh, so evil, and it, 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 it is so unbelievable, and it is so painful this is a horrible way to die, this, this sarin gas, the effects that it has. I don't want to get off on that, but uh, Haley, though, was unsuccessful in her efforts to obtain a UN response, which was during this emergency meeting at the UN Security Council, which they didn't want to have publicly. And Haley, to her credit, which is why I really like her, refused to have any meeting 
unless it was a public meeting. They wanted to do it behind closed doors. She said, ain't going to happen. So they call this emergency meeting. They go in, and she basically, oh, my goodness. And <laughs> Fox News a couple of times showed it where she's looking right into the eyes of the uh, Russian uh, delegation and I mean, you know, kind of like doing, didn't have to, but it was like this, and you, and you, and you, and you're not going to get away with this, and if you don't do anything, we will. And they didn't, and we did on Thursday. And <laughs> I mean, and it was kind of interesting, we'll talk about this more in a moment too, but uh, the President of the United States, at the time that he authorized this launching of 59 Tomahawk missiles, was hosting the president of China. Think about that. <laughs> How cool is that? I kinda, I'm kind of liking this guy. <laughs> kind of liking this president. Um, it was as if to say, uh, China, I know you're chummy with North Korea. And oh, by the way, uh, for us here in Hawaii, uh, North Korea, this uh, Kim Jong Il, who is very ill, a very sick man, <laughs> uh, wants to basically obliterate the Hawaiian Islands. So have a nice afternoon. And uh, <laughs> so, but, and, and here's this threat of war from North Korea. And it reminds me of what Jesus said in Matthew 24 about in his answer to the question asked of him by the disciples, what are going to be the signs of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus grocery lists, so to speak, these things that will take place. And one of them is that there will be wars and rumors of wars. And I think rumors is a poor translation because it could be better translated wars and threats of wars. Threats of wars. And you look at the geopolitical landscape today and what you see are these threats of wars coming from every corner of the earth and North Korea is one of them and it was as if during the dinner and before dessert Trump said okay let's just you know bomb Syria and then I'll go back and I'll tell China listen we just bombed Syria can you just uh, send that message to your buddy in North Korea <laughs> red lines mean something well, the question that many are asking is how do we know for sure that Bashar al-Assad is the one who did this? I was online and I, there are a, a plethora of sites that suggest that this was a false flag, that it wasn't Assad who did it, that it was the Syrian rebels who did it, and um, others know for a fact that it was Assad who did it to his own people, and namely Amir Sarfati of Behold Israel, who is actually right now in Israel with uh, Pastor Jack Hibbs and a group of about 150 from uh, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills. Well, they've been going on Facebook Live and basically doing updates. They did an update, I think it was on Friday, from uh, the Syrian border there in Israel. You have to understand that uh, you can actually, on a clear day from the Golan, from the border between Israel and Syria, you can actually see Damascus. That's how close in proximity it is. Well, I would really encourage you to uh, go to Behold Israel and you'll see these updates. Amir went on Facebook Live and did an update right after it happened and he assured everyone that Israel knows for a fact that it was Assad who did this. They even know the plane that dropped the chemical weapons, and they even know the pilot's name. And Amir mentions the name of the pilot, and he's an Alawite. He's a Bashar al-Assad uh, Alawite. And so this is clearly from the hands of Bashar al-Assad. Um, by the way, speaking of Amir, we have been <laughs> 
overwhelmed uh, with the interest in our upcoming trip to Israel, which is going to be in November of 2018. Not this year, but next year. The dates are going to be Friday, November 23rd to Saturday, December 1st. Now, it seems that uh, many from our online church have already responded and we are going to have to figure out what we're going to do. I know I've had a few people locally ask me, are we going to have, like last time, our own Calvary Chapel Kaneohe bus for, for our local uh, people? And then uh, last time we had another bus for our online people. Well, right now we're trying to figure out how to limit it to four buses. There are so many people that want to go, and we praise the Lord for that. So we would appreciate your prayer, by the way, <laughs> concerning how we're going to uh, do this. It would, it would seem logical that just take 10 buses. Well, there's a couple of problems with that. One of them is that you can't book the hotels for that many people. And then you also just sort of cannibalize the intimacy uh, of the trip because the sites can't handle that many people. So you're, you're going, and plus, I can't figure out how Amir and I can clone ourselves so that we can be on all the buses and all the sites all the time for all the people. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, and we appreciate your patience with us as we try to work this out. This is one of the reasons why we got such an early start on this. Many say, well, how do you know if we're going to be here uh, you know, then? Well, listen, we're either going to be in Jerusalem in uh, 2018, or we're going to be in the New Jerusalem. Either way, it's a win-win. So <laughs> we're going to get there one way or the other, preferably uh, the New Jerusalem. But anyway, that's actually not for a thousand years. But um, here's the uh, drill. If you're interested in going, you need to email Donna Lee, who is Amir's tour coordinator, and she is keeping a list of everyone who is interested and uh, she's also keeping an order uh, in which the, uh, the uh, interest and the response came in. You see her email address on the screen. Maybe the guys can do it for the online church uh, on the screen. It's Donna Lee, D-O-N-A-L-E-E, -E, at beholdisrael.org. So again, just email Donna Lee, and um, she'll get you on the list. And again, please pray that we are able to work out how we're going to, we don't want to turn anybody away, obviously, so we want to be able to facilitate everybody. Okay. I would argue that the current situation in Syria has the potential to escalate past the proverbial point of no return. And again, I don't want to come off as being sensational. I just am hoping you'll hear me out as I kind of argue this, this case. Here's the thing. If Vladimir Putin's Russia makes good on its threats of war, then it's very likely that World War III is fast upon us. I was listening to a commentator on Fox News who is suggesting that we're already at the beginning of World War III. Now, we know uh, because we know God's word, we know Bible prophecy, that World War III will be the final <laughs> uh, world war and it will usher in the Antichrist and with him the seven-year tribulation. I think one need look no further than to the response on the part of the so-called international community, or perhaps better said, the lack thereof, to see where all of this is headed. On Friday, the Jerusalem Post published a report about how Nikki Haley told the UN Security Council that the US is, quote, prepared to do more in Syria. Quoting the Post, the days of letting Bashar Assad use chemical weapons in Syria without any consequences are over. US Ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, told the Security Council on Friday morning, a few hours after the U.S. military struck on a Syrian airbase in response to a sarin gas attack on civilians earlier this week. Haley said, 
Asa did this because he thought he could get away with it. He thought he could get away with it because he knew Russia would have his back. The ambassador stated that, along with Iran, the Russian government bears considerable responsibility for the deaths, having used its veto at the UN Security Council seven times to shield the Syrian regime from hostile resolutions. We're going to talk about more in a moment why it is that Russia absolutely must keep Bashar al-Assad in power. The very existence of Russia is at stake. And that's why. The article goes on to say, in a 17-minute speech, Russian envoy Vladimir Safronkov called the U.S. airstrike, no surprise here, a flagrant violation of international law. Forget that the use of chemical weapons is a violation of international law. And an act of aggression. Adding that, and here's the threat, the consequences of this action for regional and international stability could be extremely serious. Remember, fighting words. <laughs> he also stated that Russia supports, get this, an investigation into the chemical attack instead of unilateral military action. According to the Russian envoy, the Syrian regime should be presumed innocent until proven guilty. Here's the problem with that. That sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds right, but they've already heretofore been, past tense, proven guilty. There's no presumption of innocence. The verdict's already in. The jury's not out. They are guilty, period. Of course Russia doesn't want us to believe, the world to believe that this was Assad. In fact, they want us to think that it was the Syrian rebels not Bashar al-Assad. And by the way, to those who would say Assad has nothing to gain by using chemical weapons, think about that. There are a number of reasons why Bashar stands to gain by the use of him using chemical weapons on his own people. One of them is to further this propaganda, this narrative, that it's the Syrian rebels. And it seems to have, finally, because of this US president, and I'll add Nikki Haley, it seems to have backfired on them. This tactic, this propaganda has seemingly backfired on them. Well, it seems that According to Fox News, Russia is doing more than supporting an investigation into this chemical attack. They're also sending a warship toward our two U.S. Navy destroyers that launched the missile strikes into Syria. Get this, the ship that Russia sent, probably there by now, was near the Black Sea Straits, left on a voyage after stopping for supplies and taking part in a joint exercise with Turkish ships. And oh, by the way, <laughs> Russia, Iran, Turkey, et al., they are all on Bashar al-Assad's side. Now think about that. Let that sink in. Well, speaking of Fox News, we actually have an online member that works at Fox News in New York and has become a friend of mine since she visited, visited us here in Hawaii about, I think it was about a year ago. I mention this because she has given me permission to share with you some of the information that she's been keeping me apprised of. She sent me what's known as a travel pool report, which uh, came from a pro-Israel friend of hers who, as it turns out, is now the press secretary for the aforementioned Nikki Haley. <laughs> How cool is that? And I got it first. <laughs> okay, never mind. Is that that pride we were talking about in 2 Corinthians? <laughs> is there a lightning bolt behind me yet? If there is, would you just let me know? <laughs> Here's some of what the report had to say concerning Syria. 
Secretary of State Rex Tillerson said future actions would be guided by their response to the strike. He said the strikes were successful and that they took out 20% of the seventh wing of the Syrian Air Force. Tillerson said, I don't have any information that would be appropriate to share at this point on the question of Russia's possible role in Syrian gas attack. Tillerson said, Trump told, and this is where it's kind of humorous, China's president personally about the airstrikes toward the end of the dinner, presumably before dessert, about 8.40 p.m. <laughs> the president told him how many missiles launched and the rationale behind the strike. Tillerson said he heard that China's president understood that such a response was necessary when people were killing children, but he said that official response had also come through public statements from the Chinese. Yesterday, she also sent me this release from the White House Office of the Press Secretary, which was a readout of Trump's call with King Salman bin Abd al Aziz al Saud, try to say that three times real fast, of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Quoting the readout, President Donald Trump, by the way, keep in mind that this last week, talk about multitasking, <laughs> he's uh, launching strikes in Syria, he's hosting China, he's hosting Jordan, he's talking with Saudi Arabia, and I think I'm missing about two more in there all just in the last one week. Well, anyway, uh, President Donald J. Trump spoke yesterday with the custodian of the two holy mosques, speaking of Mecca and Medina in Saudi Arabia, King Salman bin Abd al Aziz al Saud of Saudi Arabia. The king reaffirmed strong Saudi support for the United States. What? Saudi Arabia is reaffirming strong <laughs> Strong Saudi support for the United States? Wow, hang on to that, we'll come back to that. Some of you know exactly where I'm going with that. Both agreed it was necessary, a necessary response. Oh, I missed a, a very important line here. Uh, the military strike against the Sadiyat airfield in Syria and he thanked the president for his courageous action which both agreed was a necessary response to the horrible chemical weapons attack on innocent civilians. Both leaders underscored their personal commitment to strengthening the long-standing relationship between their two countries, that's the US and Saudi Arabia, and committed to remain in close contact on a range of regional and bilateral issues. Okay. I think the question that needs to be answered now is, what's next? What, what's next? Where is this heading as lines are being drawn and red lines are being crossed and actually now something's being done about the red line that's being crossed and there's no impunity as there was before under one Barack Hussein Obama. I hope you'll kindly indulge me for the remainder of our time. I want to attempt to answer this question from the scriptures and from a prophetic perspective. What follows, I believe, is evidence that proves beyond a reasonable doubt that Isaiah 17 will be the catalyst for Ezekiel 38. It's important to understand that Syria has Iraq's weapons of mass destruction and they're hid underground in, of all places, Damascus. Oh, wait a minute. I thought when we went into Iraq under George W. Bush that uh, they didn't find any weapons of mass destruction. Oh, no, they didn't because Saddam Hussein had already gotten them to his buddy Bashar al-Assad in Syria under the guise of humanitarian aid. Those weapons of mass destruction had enough time to get to Syria where they have been since then. Well, wait a minute, I thought that 
when Susan Rice got on TV and, and told us about, you know, why it's okay now because we have uh, completely uh, eliminated all of the weapons, the chemical weapons. Syria has no more chemical weapons. Kind of sounds like something that went down in Benghazi, Libya. Oh, that's another topic. For, you'll forgive my cynicism. You'll forgive my cynicism. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> You're going, nothing stopped you before, pastor, so go ahead. <laughs> All right. They are liars. They are liars. And their lies come from the father of lies, the devil himself. They are lying. This is not incompetence. This is deliberate deception. It is deliberate deception. Okay, I feel better now. Let's move on. Prophecy update already in progress. By the way, this is why Israel has launched airstrikes into Damascus over the last several months. Israel is doing this chiefly to prevent the Islamic State from getting their hands on those weapons. Because we know what the Islamic State would do with those weapons. They would eliminate, at least try, they won't succeed. They will try to annihilate Israel completely off the face of the earth. I find it rather interesting that according to the King James, Isaiah 17.1 says, the burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, taken away from being a city, hang on to that, and it shall be a ruinous heap. Now, why do I point that out? Because it suggests that the weapons in Damascus are taken away, and as such, the city itself will cease from being a city and become a ruinous heap. And it's for this reason that Russia is doing everything it can to keep Assad in control of Damascus. Here's the reason. God has put hooks in their jaws to come against Israel to take from Israel its natural gas. Already, Israel is beginning the process of exporting, we're talking big bucks, its natural gas to Russia's customers. And Putin isn't going to let that happen, or at least he thinks he can stop that from happening. You have to understand that this is what Putin is after. And Syria is the catalyst by way of Syria to get into Israel, according to Ezekiel 38, to take that spoil, that oil, that natural gas. Without it, Russia would collapse you know, in days. Russia would collapse in days, absent its ability to export natural gas. That's how, the comp that's how the country stays afloat economically. I don't have time um, to read. I wanted to read verses 1 through 13 in Ezekiel 38, but let me just quickly mention two details here. First, we have this detail of this hook in the jaw that God himself puts in the, in the mouth and brings them against Israel. And it's for the purpose of taking this spoil. But it's in verse 13 that we have a very interesting detail. And this is what I was referring to and why I share the uh, readout on the call from Trump to Saudi Arabia. We have this mention of Sheba and Dedan in verse 13 of Ezekiel 38. And this is the ancient name for the modern day area we know today as Saudi Arabia. Now the merchants of Tarshish is up for debate. Some believe it's the UK 
And if it is the UK, then the Young Lions, which is the uh, symbol of the UK, uh, the Young Lions would be potentially the US. Now, if you think about this, and especially on the heels of the stunning Brexit vote last year, if it is the UK, and it is, of course, Saudi Arabia, and if there is a very nebulous mention of the US, then it would stand to reason that verse 13 of Ezekiel 38 is coming perfectly together at the exact perfect time. Because all they do, all Saudi Arabia, the UK, the US, all the above, all they do is protest this alliance of nations with Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, all of these nations that come together and attack Israel to take this spoil, they only protest it. And if that's the case, boy, it's, I don't know how much clearer it would need to be. Well, bear with me just for a couple more minutes. I'll try to bring it to a close. For many years now, I've held to the belief that once Isaiah 17 is fulfilled, it will become a trigger of sorts that brings about the fulfillment of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, with the U.S. strikes in response to Syria's chemical weapons attack, I, I truly believe that this brings that likelihood to the forefront now more than ever. And again, I don't want to come off as being sensational, but uh, when I say this particularly, I'm not saying that it is going to happen now, there is, I believe, the possibility that Russia will back down. There's already an indication by uh, one report that they're kind of, you know, backing off. And uh, now that they've actually seen a U.S. president act like a U.S. president, and so they're kind of, you know, backing off. I mean, that's possible. But conversely, it's also not to say that it's not going to happen now. There is quite a bit of momentum, it would seem, and I would venture to say that it's very possibly an unstoppable momentum. Here are three reasons, real quick, that what happened last week may in fact be the beginning of the Isaiah 17 uh, fulfillment, and with it, the Ezekiel 38 fulfillment. Reason number one, Damascus is seemingly on the cusp of becoming a ruinous heap vis-a-vis -vis the Russian threat of war in response to the U.S. strikes. Reason number two, we've talked about this uh, over the years. Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, and particularly, as we just mentioned, Saudi Arabia, are not mentioned in Ezekiel 38 as attacking Israel. And to a nation, every one of them right now is sort of a non-player as it relates to this Ezekiel 38 attack. And then reason number three, the nations that are mentioned in Ezekiel 38 are today at the ready in their alliance to attack Israel via Syria. It's all coming together perfectly. I want to, in conclusion, ask this one question. Were Russia to respond to the U.S. missile strikes in Syria, is it possible that the fate of Damascus has been sealed? Is it possible that we are about to witness the fulfillment of Isaiah 17? I truly believe that we are on the verge of that which we are told in God's word would come to pass at the time of the end. It is coming to pass now. Before we bring our time together to an end, I want to give those who have never called upon the name of the Lord to be saved an opportunity to do so. I've been using and sharing this ABCs of Salvation as of late because I'm finding that not only are people coming to Christ, as a result, but Christians are using this as a tool to share the gospel with non-believers because it's just something that is 
so childlike simple. In Matthew 18, 3, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is the childlike, simple explanation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the ABCs of salvation, very simple. The A is for admit, or if you prefer, acknowledge that you're a sinner. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When you admit and acknowledge that you're a sinner, then you know you need the Savior. And that's where the B comes in. It's simply believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. And this brings the C and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he was crucified, buried, and rose again from the dead. And the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Why don't you all stand and we'll pray. And as we do, I want to give those of you that are here and those of you online an opportunity to simply call upon the name of the Lord, believing in your heart, confessing with your mouth, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, this is certainly an exciting time to be alive. That chosen generation, that final generation that will be alive at the time of your return when you rapture your church before the seven-year tribulation. Lord, we really truly believe that our redemption draws nigh. But we're also keenly aware of those who have not called upon you, those who are not ready for you. And so, Lord, I just pray that if there's anybody here in this wonderful church that is my privilege to pastor today that has never called upon you, or someone watching online from somewhere, anywhere in the world that has never called upon you, that today would be the day of their salvation that they would surrender to you and call upon you, put their faith and trust in you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.